Hi everybody, this is the second lecture <clears throat> for the Mongol Moment, Chapter 12 of Unit 3. So, now, we're going to now look at how uh, three different parts of the world encountered the Mongols as the Mongols were completing their conquests. So first, in China. The last Chinese dynasty before, before the Mongols was the Song Dynasty, and the conquest of China took 70 years, so this was a long and brutal struggle. In northern China, you had more violence, and more destruction and depopulation. But then finally, as the Mongols started pushing it to south, or into the southern part of China, there was a little less resistance and more negotiation there. Because basically there were people who were less willing to really sort of fight against this machine that was rolling over China. So by 1279, it's done. Now, the Great Khan, at the time that this conquest was completed, was named Kublai Khan. And after the conquest was done, he basically renamed the Great Khanate in order to give it a Chinese name, or the Yuan Dynasty. So, in Chinese dynastic history, after the Song Dynasty, the next dynasty is the Yuan, although it is ruled by the Mongols. And he moved the capital city of China to Beijing, in the very far north of China, which is still the capital actually today. Now, once Kublai Khan and the Mongols were in sort of final control of China, there was very little assimilation of the Mongols into Chinese society. They openly discriminated against the Chinese. They didn't allow the Chinese to have any, you know, roles as high government officials. So all of, like, the Confucian scholar gentry were out. There was no intermarriage allowed between the Chinese and the Mongols. They didn't want the Mongols, you know, they didn't want themselves to become, like, you could say, soft and, you know, settled like the Chinese. They wanted them to stay tough and, you know, nomadic. And Mongol warriors stationed in China would actually be sent back to the steppe for some times in order to sort of keep them tough and keep them sort of, you know, you know, connected to their roots. Now, they did, though, do some rituals that were sort of Confucian, and Kublai Khan was sort of fascinated with Chinese culture and history, but very few Mongols ever learned the Chinese language or really sort of adopted Chinese culture at all, and the opposite was true as well. Very few Chinese really sort of, you know, interacted with or wanted to become Mongol. Now, they maintained the central government of China, but rather than the Confucian exams, they actually imported Persian government administrators, people from elsewhere in the empire, to actually sort of help them run the empire. They basically didn't really trust the Chinese to, like, help them run the country themselves. And, in a very sort of unique moment for China, they invited foreign trade very openly into China. And merchants in China, really for the first time in their history, saw official support that allowed them to raise their status very high and very quickly. Now, however though, they, this is one of the places where the Mongols started running into trouble. They tried to invade Vietnam by sea, they tried to invade Japan twice by sea. In all cases, they failed, for a variety of reasons. Weather military resistance, and this was one of the places where the Mongols started kind of showing a little bit of weakness. Now finally, in the 1320s, the Black Death began, and it emerged somewhere in East or Southeast Asia, and this is something that wreaked havoc in China. And in the wake of the Black Death, people in China started to think, ah, have the Mongols lost the Mandate of Heaven? Have they lost the, um, you know, the will of the gods to put them on the throne? And in 1368, a new Chinese dynasty was created after a wave of peasant rebellions against the Mongols. Um, in 1368, the Ming dynasty came to power, and Chinese rule over China was restored. Now, in Japan, though, when the Mongols were trying to invade, they sent fleets of hundreds of ships and thousands and thousands of men. And both times, major storms destroyed most of the ships before they even made it to shore. So in Japanese history, these storms were known as the kamikaze, the wind of the kami, the wind of the gods, that destroyed these ships and protected Japan from invasion. And after successfully defending Japan then, the daimyo, the feudal warlords of Japan, the, who controlled the land, and the samurai, the warrior elites who fought for them, they started to gain more power and more respect from the people of Japan because of their successful defense from this invasion. And in Vietnam, you know, fleets were there were also destroyed by storms as they were approaching Vietnamese land. Now in Persia, <clears throat> here the Khanate in Persia is called the Il Khanate. And in 1258, 
they um, conquered the city of Baghdad, which had been the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate. Now, by this time, the Abbasid Caliphate had mostly fallen apart, and it was really just the city of Baghdad. And Turkic sultanates had ruled the areas around, uh, around the Middle East, outside of Baghdad. But the Caliphate, this title that you know implied a unified Islamic world, now it was going to be gone when the Mongols finally conquered the city, destroyed the caliphate once and for all. So, now as they were sweeping through Persia and Mesopotamia, though, this is where the Mongols did a huge amount of destruction. And, you know, canals, irrigation systems were annihilated, partly as a way to, like, starve out the population and starve them into submission. And the depopulation was so vast, and also then the Black Death later on, that... Iraq, the modern country of Iraq, it may not have actually reached its pre-Mongol population until the 1900s. So this took a long time to recover from the uh, Mongol conquests. Now, in the Middle East, though, this is where you see the most assimilation by the Mongols into the groups that they had conquered. So Persia and the Middle East, this is where you already had this kind of blend of Persian elites, Arab elites who had taken over the Middle East, and Turkics, who had also invaded and taken over parts of the Middle East. And they had kind of mixed with each other to create this kind of elite um, warrior and political class. So the Mongols now just kind of became another one of these groups. You know, Mongols married Persian people, and they started learning the local languages. They converted to Islam in great numbers. So this is the one place where you have Mongols really sort of becoming the thing that they had conquered. And they ruled through a Persian-style bureaucracy, just like the caliphate had after it took over this area. And they really sort of became locals. So, now this is also a place, though, where the Mongols ran into some problems. They tried to invade Egypt and were resisted by the, um, by the Egyptian sultanate that ruled there. So this is another place where the Mongols did start to run into problems. And also then after the Black Death, this is where the Mongols, you know, once again start to lose some control because of the aftermath and the chaos caused by that disease. Now, in Russia, the Golden Horde invaded Russia and destroyed the Kievan Rus states um, in the early 1200s. So that first Russian civilization, their leadership is destroyed brutally in the course of a few years. But then the Mongols, though, they make an, arrange an arrangement with the locals. Basically, like... Persia and China, these places were really densely populated, really wealthy, really well connected to major trade routes. Russia, they didn't really sort of, you know, consider to be quite on the same level and really sort of worth occupying. So the Mongols basically stayed on the steppe, but once in a while they would come back to collect tribute. And if they needed to, you know, they would implement some more brutality to kind of make the point. So local princes from the city of Moscow, they negotiated a settlement with Moscow, or excuse me, with the Mongols, where they would be the ones who kind of ruled Russia for the Mongols, collected tribute, um, maintained order, and then would, you know, kick that tribute back to the Mongols when they wanted it. So, to some extent, Russia kind of stayed a little bit more independent, and were still sort of ruled by Russians. But, they were kind of cut off from trade with Western Europe um, or with other parts of the world. So, the Mongols then really did not assimilate into Russia at all, and Russia maintained their unique culture. So they, they continued speaking their language. They continued to do um, Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And the Mongols did try to push a little farther into Central Europe, but basically just decided it wasn't worth the effort, and they stayed out on the steppe. And then finally, in the late 1400s, this is when Moscow finally leads a resistance against the Mongols and overthrows them once and for all. So, now the Mongols then, when they were in power, they intensified interregional trade um, across their empire, and this was really kind of a golden age of the Silk Road, because the whole Silk Road was under their control. So, they built way stations, they built caravanserai, and their policy of religious toleration allowed more interaction. They were okay with people of different religions moving freely through the empire. So they didn't really make much themselves, but they promoted trade and commerce. And they moved a lot of people, too. The Mongols enslaved and forcibly moved a lot of people, you know, to wor work as government officials or engineers. 
or just simply as slaves to be used for labor and as property. And merchants and religious missionaries moved freely all across the empire, and the Mongols themselves, you know, around the empire started converting to all different religions. And there's one um, really sort of famous example of someone who moved easily and freely, Marco Polo, who was from the city of Venice in Italy, which wasn't even in the empire, but he decided to go and see what was out there. And once he got into the empire, it was very easy for him to move across the empire, across the Silk Road, and kind of see everything that was there. And according to his stories that he left behind, he actually worked for Kublai Khan very briefly while he was in China. But there's no other independent verification that that actually happened. Now, this is also when you see a real sort of great speed up in the spread of technology all across Afro-Eurasia. So gunpowder from China now spreads wildly through the Middle East into Europe. Um, printing technology starts making it across the Middle East and into Europe. Um, high, high temperature furnaces to make really good quality steel tools and weapons. This technology spreads and so on and so on. And it just becomes this kind of, you know, really sort of intensified exchange of ideas. And Central and Western Europe, they were never conquered by the Mongols. And they were kind of terrified of the Mongols, you know, one day showing up. But because they weren't sort of destroyed by the conquest, they still absorbed all of these new technologies that were making it across very quickly. So eventually, by the 1400s, Europeans actually become masters of printing technology, masters of gunpowder technology, um, because they brought in and adapted all of these technologies. Now, and here's a map showing you Marco Polo's travels. He went on a few different trips across the Silk Road and around the Indian Ocean that took him all over the Mongol Empire. And it was possible to do that because of just how big and sort of unified this system was. Now, eventually, though, the Mongol Empire will collapse. And it's mostly due to the Black Death, also known as the Bubonic Plague. So, it had been several hundred years since the Bubonic Plague struck Afro-Eurasia. The last major outbreak was in the 500s, um, the Plague of Justinian, that helped to weaken the Byzantine Empire. But the Bubonic Plague, though, it began in East Asia and spread along trade routes, mostly along the Silk Road, and then finally made it to Europe, the Middle East. Now, as it went, in the major cities especially, the population decline was enormous. 30 to 50 percent of the areas that, it, that encountered the plague died from it within a few years. And it recurred every few decades for a couple hundred more years. It didn't really go away. So, now, as it spread, you know, the big cities were the ones hardest hit, which meant the places where the trade was happening, where production of, you know, really high-value goods was happening, was going to decline. You know, the population of the countryside declines, so less land will be cultivated, less food will be produced, which just kind of complicates the problem even more. People in positions of power are going to die. Economic elites, political elites. This causes enormous upheaval. Social upheaval, political upheaval, economic upheaval. And governments across Afro-Eurasia are really going to be sort of struggling to hold on to any semblance of power. And rebellions then begin against the Mongols and against, you know, governments outside of the Mongol Empire. And all across the Afro-Eurasia, and especially in Western Europe, peasant rebellions against landlords increase because landlords are struggling to hold on to their land and they need peasants now because there's a shortage. So peasants start to basically push for more and more rights against the landlords who had been sort of keeping them in a position of subservience. And in Western Europe, some serfs, people who had been essentially slaves tied to the land, become free as a result of the sort of upheaval caused by the Black Death. So this is something that, you know, among those who survived, wasn't always necessarily going to leave them in a worse position. In some cases, people saw their quality of life improve in the aftermath because of some new freedom that it allowed. But of course, you know, that's after the devastation had occurred. Now, in sub-Saharan Africa, or Africa, and in India, where there was less, you know, constant flow of people going back and forth along these trade routes, you see there's less impact in those places. And for the most part, India and Sub-Saharan Africa will be kind of spared from this wave of the Vionic Plague. Now, in addition to the plague, though, there's going to be conflict among the Khanates themselves. Sometimes it's caused by the plague, where, you know, borders will be shut down, and you start to see Khanates, rather than, you know, 
allowing trade to move freely, they start to clamp down and they try to conquer more territory from each other in order to control resources directly rather than just trading for them with their neighbors. And as you know, food supplies go down and as tribute and taxes decline, Khanates start scrambling for more resources, for more places to find revenue. So there's going to be wars between the different Khanates. The Il Khanate will fight the Golden Horde. The Jagadai Khanate will fight against the Yuan Dynasty. And you start to see the Mongols then in some cases, their leadership collapses, and they simply just leave. The Golden Horde just goes back to the steppe. Um, some, some of the Ilkhanate go back to Central Asia, although many sort of stay you know, in the Middle East as part of the new elite group there. Mongols in China flee back to Mongolia and basically just hunker down and go back to the way of life they knew prior to the conquests. So... This empire then, basically just as quickly as it exploded out of Mongolia in the 1200s, in the 13-1400s, it's going to contract just as quickly. So, after that then, a few successor states emerge. So this is going to be the kingdoms and empires that take the place of the old Mongol Empire. So, in China, the Ming Dynasty restores Chinese Confucian imperial rule in 1368. In Russia... Moscow becomes the capital of a new Russian empire, and we're going to see that they'll basically spend the next few hundred years expanding to the east, you know, across the steppe into Siberia. In the Middle East, there's two big empires that begin to emerge. The Ottoman Turks, who had settled in modern-day Turkey, in Anatolia, they begin to emerge. They take over Constantinople, and they conquer then Egypt, they conquer Mesopotamia, they become the new sort of superpower in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, and they're going to be an Islamic empire. In Persia, a new dynasty rules there, based on Shia Islam, called the Safavid dynasty, and they'll be in power for the next couple hundred years. So once again, this is all happening after the Mongols are gone. Now in India, though, something unique happens. A group of Mongol Turkic um, warriors who had been based in Central Asia, you know, during the old Mongol empire, they're going to invade India in the 1500s and create a new, um, a new dynasty there called the Mughal dynasty. And this is actually derived from the word Mongol. So this is a Muslim Mongol Turkic invading force from Central Asia that takes over Northern India. And once again, they're Muslim, but they're going to be ruling over an enormous Hindu majority. And that's an empire that will also gain strength over the next couple hundred years. So the Mongol empire gone, new empires and kingdoms, new successor states in. So here are some vocab words that you can test your knowledge with um, from the last couple of lectures. And here are four review questions to go over. Um, so stop here, think about these, and see what you can come up with. I'll see you in class. Bye.